you, isn't it? Um, okay, so the first poem, it's about sport. I know nothing about sport. Um, it's called Hanging a Snowman, uh, which I know sounds like the sad demise of a mound of snow in spring, but um, it's baseball language uh, for like eight runs in an inning, so it sort of makes the shape of a snowman. Um, so yeah, hanging a snowman. A pop fly at my first baseball match, watching the Cubs in Chicago. A patient I had met in a psych ward took me. I think he was repenting for a lot in his own way whilst he was in some sort of stage of recovery. A meatball flying past a hot corner, that can of corn did fly comet-like, right past the slotted, setting rays of sun that slipped in between the lines of crowded seats that silhouetted all us viewers, even our extra-large sodas and screens. It was hot that evening, sat in knee-torn jeans, the oversized dark blue cob shirt he lent me, because he clearly put some thought into this treat. From underneath my cap rim, I saw the skin around his eyes crease enough. They could have momentarily cradled a tear. His smile under that grey trimmed beard was nothing like the smile I saw when I first met him. Against the backdrop of white walls, I mean God, then we were sat in such a different light. Folks, it's a golden sombrero here at Wrigley Field tonight. Only when I saw his face in a photo of this day did I remember his name. I never decided to stop replying to his emails, but I stopped, and I have no idea if he's still breathing or not. Okay, so the next one uh, is a period poem, because I'm a woman who's given like every type of contraception, so I could <laughs> really not write um, a period poem, so it's called A Red Reading. Um, and the rose nest slipped right on out of her. No rush as she rolled all that redness up, sudden tissue ball in her palm with the string whipping about the tiled place. Stumbling down, sat on the toilet seat. She almost studies womanhood, better drunk here, holding the sheddings of her womb and the tin sound of it being chucked away, echoing in our auditory passages the toilet flushes, the taps sob, she flicks her hands and walks off through the doorless doorway, light bulb giving out one last flicker. Right, so... <laughs> so the next three are like a sequence all together, all under the title um, Winter Ostinato, I don't know if there's musicians in here, but... It's like a music term for a pattern that repeats, and I've got a line in all three of them that repeat, so that's why. Um, so one, Icicle Symphony. Okay. Because it's the coldest winter we've had in decades, I think of icicles, and the thought of icicles directs me through my mind maps of memory to the hue of my dad's lips when I saw him lying dead. A friend had said, don't panic, they make them look alive, as if it was really the fact he looked dead and not the fact that he was actually dead that caused me to feel far beyond panic. But anyway, she'd seen her dead one days after he had drawn his last breath. Whereas my dad had had a whole week of being looked at only by strangers, the ones who had put him in a suit, though he looked more and more the empty vessel he now was, the vacant body who was letting go of everything. He didn't look alive, he looked dead, like he was, like how. When he was alive, he always looked like what he was. A beauty of a toddler, a scallywag kid, a little shit, a genius young man, a newlywed, an adult genius and crumbling under it. A father, a teacher, a mathematician, a navy man, a father again, a philosopher, a drinker, an atheist, a pizza delivery man, a man who had lost a baby boy, a man who had had another baby boy later in life, the dad who took me to Sunday swimming lessons, the dad who forgot my teenage birthdays, a man hurt, lost, ill, 
a dead body in a suit in a chapel of rest where I'd never felt less rested. I'd stab myself in the heart with a rusty carrot if it meant any good at all could come from it. And I'd let my last tear be an icicle. My last words be, hello, I've missed you so much. Arctic bus stop. Listening to the end of All Our Exploring by Max Richer as I run for the bus, but the bastard driver leaves minutes earlier than he's meant to because it's the coldest winter we've had in decades. Stood for half an hour after a 12 hour shift of I don't know what I'm doing, my toes and fingertips hurting maybe more than they ever have. I think I feel my soul lift a little from my body outside of the middle. The sounds of echoing sneezes and exhaust pipes and tower block congregation talk fills the air, but not as thoroughly as this fucking frost. I dropped my lighter when running. A man who joins me for frozen talk lets me keep peace. Very cold, isn't it? Particularly cold. As we rush onto the bus and take seats separate from one another, I feel my soul land back into me, readjusted. I blow on my fingertips, count to ten, Mentally prepare to heat some spaghetti hoops when I get home. Count to ten and hope I never have a year. That's as sharp and fat with waiting as the half an hour at that bus stop. <laughs> third one of that lot. Cathedral contemplation. <laughs> so I went to this cathedral a couple weeks ago and had like my first ever fine from throwing a fag bar on the floor, <laughs> it's like a nice welcome to Bristol because I just moved there. So I run away to Bristol Cathedral because it's the coldest winter we've had in decades. Here, quietness and lofty bubbles of silence are nothing but comforting. Here, for solitude and prayer to language, I walk around the name. If all the words from prayers I've said were towered, they would reach the vaulted ceiling and touch its sun-kissed decorations. When were they last touched by hands? I go through the choir stalls, all their warm orange lamps, symmetrically, ceremonially lit, make my way past the cathedral gardens, its herb patches and many benches exuding holy invite, and find the marvellous cubicle. It's the end one in the ladies, but it's wider than its door, which you don't expect from a cubicle. I, it had its own clouded over gothic chapel windows, with a wide windowsill behind the radiator, the warmest I've been in months. I wedge myself on the sill, say our men by starting to let a pen slide on paper, crucifying the page, then leave, and just before exiting, place a prayer in the prayer request basket. That will be read during matins at 8.30 a.m., with the same feeling of hope and doubt as when I blow out birthday candles or wish on a shooting star. in America, <laughs> so uh, caught on the backyard decking, <laughs> behind my shades, I could see a stranger abandon his lawnmower to watch me rub the last of the oil into my stomach. I slipped my shades to the top of my head so he would know I knew he was watching, not to make him feel bad or caught out, because moments later my upper hand was slipping from my stomach between my legs, rubbing the black, useless, wet material there, and he stepped closer to the fence, but still stood far enough away I couldn't hear him if he spoke, which meant he couldn't hear my breaths, so I had to make damn sure it was clear I was going to come. My fingers under the bikini worked fast, for worry it wouldn't happen before one of us had to leave. Laid on my back, my body arched in waves, light-headed as my cunt gained weight, the treetops blurred the sky, and children's voices blurred the dead centre focus of this primal, inappropriate touch. My body vibrated more than if I'd been sat on a still-running lawnmower, and climaxing was hard but brief because of the thrill filling the breeze. But just to make sure he absolutely understood, I held up my used two fingers in front of my face, 
flip those fingers and thumb like a gun to shoot him before they were sucked clean. <laughs> uh, oranges. On a dark Friday in the early night, I walked past an orange on the pavement by a parked ambulance in a setback car park on the faltering street lights and hefty air. No stars were shining, but this orange seemed to do so. And for a fleeting moment, I had the mental image of a lady in a long, thick skirt, scurrying up the outside stairs of the two-story building, which I felt pretty certain was a collection of retirement flats, as she unknowingly dropped her orange juice from a hole in one of her bags for life, and her not knowing she would be close to dying that night not knowing a solitary orange would sit so perfectly upright, shining, with more chance than herself. A mile and a bit later along the bypass, I found an upper orange, and near its lantern crescent was a dead horse in a sloping field. So, I got a poem, and it's like five minutes on its own. Do, do we really want to hear that? Yeah, do you, do you guys it? actually want to sit for a five minute? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is actually years older than any of the other stuff from tonight, I think. Um, wrote, I did a year in America and I wrote it about seeing Niagara Falls for the first time. Um, it's called A Risen Time. <sighs> Spring break and we were back in Buffalo, the same pancake place we went to around Thanksgiving. Our first Thanksgiving, New York State and Jamie and Jamie's mum were in the car. We stopped to skim stones under a bridge and skim our fullness. With shared splits around the shared family for meal two, and our her two uncles joined we and them all then skimming stones and being grateful for it. We did pancakes and the next morning the packing of the car. Then Nana took us four non mullocks and her girls over the Canadian border drifting over gushing waters a million times the strength of all of the time past till now that had tears in the seconds. And after the car scan, passport loss and pass and air pumps, we in Canada, us all in Canada, us now over there from the other side we stood upon. On that Thanksgiving, looking then through eye level rainbows to over there the line of Canada and what I didn't know. I didn't know Clifton Hill. In Sound of Niagara, we trod upon dampened streets, sat on oversized wooden chairs and shop entrances and felt tinier for it. Felt tinier, hearing the constant aquatic surge, but looking at surrounding fun fair, fair fun we had from a 30-foot ferris wheel damp in our shores wrapped overheads. Or damp nothing, damp unprepared, damp cigs, damp trouser ends, damp hands, damp tech scent, and warm bubbling stomachs 30 feet high. Being 21 doesn't matter there, and fuck did the girls know it. The six of us in the room for four, ridding ourselves from damp clothes for clothes, sentenced to Niagara's damp. Niagara's holy spray and lovely chilly mist. After many mascara bottle pumps and burps, we took our six alcohol-filled bellies out for alcohol, arm in swaying arm, spanning road width and no fucks given as dancer legs were kicked and smoke was exhaled. And they all looked so pretty and perfect and angelic to me then, as I squatted by a bush peeing, the closest pee to one of the wonders of the world I may ever take. Niagara's aura flicked at my heels as I caught the girls up. Shots, 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 and more heat in our bellies. And Osinski joined us during the night. He joined us. And we took turns having rides on his wheelchair, screaming with laughter. And he accelerated and did wheel skids and dragged beer with us. People at the bar from our hotel, they had weed, they said, I don't know, then there was Jamie stumbling and maybe someone vomiting ghastly hard somewhere, but maybe I didn't know them, and there may have been a few minutes where we lost Osinski, but then we had Osinski, and I wonder if he had wheeled us all to bed that night, and intoxicated dreams were interrupted, like a sermon when the priest sneezes and the man with the most operatic voice in the world says, bless you, and we had to wake because that was the plan. I had to wake and didn't, and Yasmina shook me awake. I grimaced and swallowed back puke far too casually, and we couldn't wake Ashley. 
and Osinski apparently went back to America during our two hours of comatose, so we didn't dare wake Jamie. Her pouting lips in unison with furrowed brow, even in sleep. She was in hangover place already. Yasmina shook Laura, Mimi, and we climbed over Ashley, hugging the floor in fetus position, and us four stuck to the plan. The plan was all I had in mind as my gut pounded me, inside out, yelling at me. You stupid girl, stop doing this to me. And I could tell, as I caught Laura's wincing eyes, her strong body was furious too, and we smiled at it. The roar got louder, the mist was the most refreshing lightness I felt in my life, and I wanted to live in it. I wanted to learn to float so I could live in Niagara's steamy breaths. And as all that water breathed, the plan succeeded all around us. We were the only ones in sight of the falls, and light started to ooze. Like the heaviest of curtains drawn back, light chased across the ground. Light reflected in tons of uncontainable, beautiful, powerful water. And all I could hear was water, and all I could see was light. It was like the only sunrise that could ever matter. In my drunk, sleepy head, it was the only sunrise that would ever matter. If the sun never rises again, I know that day it did. So I've just got a couple more. Um, what is there to do during heartbreak? Taking small steps. Literally, I took the smallest steps through my mother's hallway towards the window ajar, and I haven't the smallest comprehension of birdsong. I think he is keeping the door open a bit. I'm not sure if that tiny sliver of hope is keeping me going or killing, but it is the only thing I pray to. Hottest tears are cold and lonely. My hair is tangled, and if I cut it all off, it would still be tangled apart from me. What is there to do during heartbreak? I have seen Niagara Falls and wrote a poem about wanting to float in her steam. Now it feels all the water I have ever seen is drowning my grasps of love. I don't understand it any more, more, because he kept saying, love isn't enough, love isn't enough. But I always thought it's the only thing that could ever really matter. And now all my life is learning what to do with heartbreak. So far it's the news on repeat with no attention paid to it, feeling worse in the time following waking, and he spaces every surface that I cannot touch. This next poem is all about my dog, because I got really <laughs> scared that I was going to lose her like two nights before Christmas, but she's fine. Um, so it's called The Whole Night. Her grey muscle glimmered like a beacon in the flickers of street light. My plump but not obese dog, possessed by a fear she had never felt before. All of me ugly twisted from the internal seesaw, between desperate faith and bitterness slashing at everything. That she was hurting like this, all of her beautiful and unknowing and tinkering on the edge of finality. I lay on the floor next to her. My mother curled up on the sofa, sailing between sleep and awake. In this whole universe, is there anyone listening? And if there is, do they happen to care? I knew just as much as nothing. This dog with a heartbreakingly sweet face, looking through the dark, my hand hovering over her fur. My mother who really birthed the possibility of any of this happening, oblivious to it all in sleep. And Shandy's breathing returning to normal in the freedom of the early hours. Okay, two more. Uh, it's a short one, it's a sonnet. A prayer louder from mass. I think I did this on the MA next, you might remember this. I remember the first one as well. Ah. Um, I pray properly, not half-assed, rarely. I prayed yesterday because I thought something bad. And like a terrified child, knowing they've been caught, red-handed, clutching what they shouldn't, I breathed only sorry, face skewed, knees meeting the wooden floor. After muttering recycled apologies, I asked for some peace for my family, said amen, then I heard my own name. Why would my name drift through mind? I didn't need to call myself. As if the cells themselves had fought it, perhaps the cells themselves had fought it. Perhaps my family cells will pray. The last one, uh, I thought I'd finish.
finish with a blowjob poem. <laughs> um, so it's called Sacred Suck and Sigh. <laughs> it wasn't falling on my sinful knees, but landing on them purposefully, the hotel carpet burning, my one hand tight around it, sacred squeezing and rubbing it centimetres from my face, I looked up and saw the stretch of his arm, that worshipping hand on my mouth, smell of lingering lager on his stroking fingertips, I flicked my head enough so that my long hair fell behind me richly out of the way. I closed my eyes and opened my mouth, speaking only in one tongue. I took it wholly, and he moaned both hands on the back of my head, my body bracing in such a way I could take shove after shove with swallows, tasting his flesh, that saltiness and sweat, pure like the mirroring spasms between my legs. The further we got, the more I could hear my oral splats and splutters, Feel it collecting around my chin with the odd escaped tear. My leaked eyeliner, the written ink of prayer on my cheek. And as he came, flooding my warm throat, calling the end of our importance, I said my benediction with the sliding withdrawal of his member from my mouth, his remaining juices swashing in my gut, deep and scented. Oh.